Fred Lampropoulos, founder, CEO of Merit Medical, and uh, you were Special Forces military, two-time political candidate, and your band even opened for The Doors and The Beach Boys all those years ago. Thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Over the years, what role has focus, laser focus, played in your success? I think it's everything. Um, it really makes the difference uh, in terms of markets and personnel, a vision for the future. Without that, you really don't have much, and people can't get on board. You, you have to encourage and you have to uplift, and people have to buy into your vision without that. Um, and what are they looking for? Well, they're looking for the focus and the vision of the future and what role do they play. Without it, you really don't have much. You tell the story of how Merit Medical got its start on just one device, the coronary control syringe. Yeah. What made you think at the time that drawing up a business plan surrounding just one device <laughs> was going to turn into what it has yeah. become today? Did you have any idea? But the answer is, well, I did have an idea, and I really wrote a 100-year business plan. So even though we only had one product to start out with, I'd written a business plan that had many, many products and many, many ideas. And in fact, it was kind of interesting because I'm asked about that today. Merit just turned 30 years old. So we're 30 years into a 100-year business plan. And, and someone might say, well, why so long? And the answer is in medical devices. If you're not thinking globally and thinking for the long term, you're not going to be in business. So the answer was a single product because it was all we could afford. We didn't have any money. But we had a plan to be much bigger than that. Where are you now in that business plan in relationship to the 100 years? Yeah. So we're 30 years into it. We're now approaching um, about a billion dollars in revenue, ramping at that rate. Our market cap at three and a half billion with 5,500 employees globally. So we still have a long ways to go to get to uh, 100 years. I'll be long gone. But I think both in terms of succession, in terms of products, and what we want the company to be are things that are well thought out. And I think that culture is something that everybody understands that works there. When you were first starting out, what qualified you to invent medical devices? You know, I have to just tell you that that really hits a, a note with me because, you know, I'm a kid that moved to Salt Lake City. My first home was Pioneer Park. That's where I lived. Mm -hmm. And we, we were homeless. And the Greek community took, uh, fed us. They gave us a home to live in, and we couldn't even pay to turn the water on. I went to high school to Granite, at Granite High School. I went off to this, the first member of my family to graduate from high school, the only member. Mm -hmm. Went to Westminster College, ran out of money, and then the band part and seeing Jim Morrison saying, well, I'm going to have to do something. There's a war going on, and so I joined the Army. But going from a private to an officer, and then when I left the military, I went into the financial business. I went to work as a stockbroker. So I learned what it takes, uh, to, you know, what a balance sheet is, what an income statement is, how, you know, what cash does, the things you need to know to be in business. But the reason why that's so sensitive to me is I've had people question me my whole life, what qualifies you to do this? You're nobody. You're just a regular guy off the street. And that's exactly what I am. But I'm self-taught. I have more patents than Steve Jobs. That's a lot oh of patents, my. hundreds. I think the things I learned in terms of leadership, um, uh, finance, and just you know taking charge and running a business, but involving and recognizing that everybody has to be part. You have to have all the different players to be successful. So I think everything I did, whether it be surviving, excelling, taking risk, joining the Army, going to OCS, learning the financial industry, and then coming up and, and really taking everything I had and putting into this thing eminently qualify me, but maybe not to the learned person. I might be the least qualified, but they're very likely to work for me today. One of the things that sets you apart from other innovators, as I've read, is your uh, penchant for s scrubbing in on surgeries, asking doctors and nurses all kinds of questions, and then listening very carefully to what they tell you in order to go back and innovate some kind of device. Where did you learn how to do that, and are you still doing it? 
Well, the answer is I don't have as much time to go scrub in all the time. Although I'm around it, I watch a lot of video of procedures and so on. But in the old days, I used to do it once or twice a week. Um, I think I learned it, though, from my dad. My dad taught me that, you know, you have to kind of sell the sizzle. Find something that you love. Find something that you are willing to stand up for, a product, an idea. And, and I think when you learn those things, my dad, I, I don't think he was ever successful in a, a product idea. He worked hard, and he fed us, and he did all those things, but he just kept trying. I, I think you add all of those things up. Um, and, and, and maybe the most important of it, Bob, was that you know, we have customers. All the answers are just laying out there. You just have to listen and connect the dots. It, it's not as complicated, but people kind of missed, you know, they just think, well, you have a product and you want to do something. It's not what I want to do. It's what do my customers want to do? And what do my customers want me to do for them? That's the key to it, not what I want. What do they want? And somehow that's missed a lot. You know, it's more about personal ambition and I want to do this and I want to do that. That doesn't work. What does my customer want? What does my customer need? And how do I know that? Well, I'm there. I go to trade shows. I'm watching videos. I'm scrubbing in. I, my friends are all doctors. We sit and talk about this and that. I, I think those are the things that make the difference in really how we built this business is listening. What is it that you love about medical devices that would have you turn your whole life upside down to be such an expert on them? Well, I think a lot of it still has to do with that. I have a chip on my shoulder. You can see both of them up here. They're invisible right now. But um, of everybody saying, well, you can't do this. You're not qualified to do this. Um, you know, somebody, some doctor should be doing this or some engineer. Um, but, you know, they all, again, forget products have to be sold. Products have to be packaged. Um, in my view, if you're a salesperson, you still rule the world. You have a special forces military background. You've led men in combat. You started Merit Medical from scratch. It's now nearing a billion dollar company with 5,500 employees worldwide. What is it about leadership that attracts you so much? I think uh, officers taught me that you need to do three things. You need to keep your troops informed. You need to feed them. And you never put your interest in front of theirs. And if you do that, they will follow you and they will die for you to the ends of the earth. Three simple thoughts and ideas. And if you miss off one of those and put your interest or you don't take care of your troops and they don't know what they're going to do, then you don't have their confidence. And without confidence, you don't have leadership. Give me some examples of translating what you learned in the military to what you execute now at Merit Medical. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I just laugh a little bit because some of these things drive people crazy. Um, you don't come into one of my meetings without your shoes shined. You pay attention to detail. If you come out to Merit Medical, you will see everything is dress right dress. Every, every bit of grass, every bush, every window, every, you know, and things are washed and cleaned and put in a military manner, as I like to say. And I think that discipline um, is important. I think the pride that comes from it, I mean, even if you go to Merit today, you'll find all the business people all dressed like this. This isn't just for this show. This is what we do all the time. There's no dress down Friday. There is no dress down Friday. We are in dress uniform at all times. I think that builds confidence, I think, in your appearance, in the way you think of yourself. And very candidly, you're just not part of the group. You're not like everybody else. You know, we're, uh, we're sales and marketing guys. We're um, with, you know, hundreds of engineers and PhDs and physicians that work in this business. I remember looking at a second lieutenant as a private, one, you know, just looking at the brass, looking at the boots, looking at the uniform, looking at this, and I thought, man, that's pretty cool. That's hard to do. But it's that discipline and focus on the little things that help take care of the big things. You obviously have a tremendous passion for Merit Medical and medical devices and this incredible organization that you have built. In 2004, you ran for governor. You would have had to have left the company in order to be an effective governor. What were you thinking? Yeah, well, I ask myself all the time, you know, what was I thinking? And I'll tell you exactly what I was thinking. Um, 
I was thinking that our economic development and our policies in the state of Utah at the time were favoring businesses from outside of the state of Utah. It was other companies that they were giving grants to and this and that, and yet here we are homegrown, but because we're already here, oh, we're not going to pay any interest to you. And I thought, you know, I'm going to get out there and tell people how local businesses are being treated. And, you know, as, as you know, things come and go and technology comes here and the business is in town and then they're gone, you know, we've been here for 30 years. And almost all of those technology companies that came, some of that still have a presence here, we employ more people. So I wanted to, I was angry. I got turned down on a couple of things that we needed as a company to survive, but the other guys got them even though we employed more people. So I didn't like it. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to go spend my money and I'm going to let people know that there's other ways to look at that thing. Now, what came out of that? Well, you know, we talk about silicon slopes and we talk about medical devices. Uh, we helped to pass what I think is the most aggressive research and development tax credit in the country so that we could be competitive with California, with New York, with Minnesota. So all of those things, I think, were a function of just a little bit you know, of anger and someone needed to speak up. And I almost won. Almost doesn't count, but I made a presence. Yeah, yeah. Forbes magazine has called Utah the best place in the country to do business. Do you recognize your place personally and Merit Medical's place in that distinction? Oh boy, you know, that's, uh, that's climbing to the top of the hill. Um, I hope so. I, you know, I don't go around, you know, people often ask, well, aren't you, um, aren't you proud of what you've accomplished? And aren't you this and aren't you that? I never really think of that, Bob. I, what I think about is, you know, what we're going to do this year, what we're doing five years from now, I don't have time to look back and say, oh, look at this. Isn't this wonderful? Um, you know, I think what Satchel Paige said, you know, don't look back because they might be gaining on you. So I, I don't care about the past. I care about the future. And I care, and it starts with the present. So yeah, I think it's great. Now, we're also victims of our own success. You know, we have a 3% unemployment rate. You know, the availability of labor is very, very difficult. And I think there are some challenges and things we need to think about going forward. We're going to almost, remember, you can grow yourself out of business. Mm. You know, you got to make those payables. you got to make those payrolls. You can get those revenues, but if you don't have all the other stuff. And I'm concerned that we have to have managed growth. I think the governor, I think the legislature has done a good job. But listen, I can tell you, this morning when I left to come here and to visit with you, we had... 178 openings at Merit Medical. 178 open positions. How am I going to fill them? Where are they going to come from? We're recruiting from universities. We're doing job fairs. We're doing internships. We're doing all of those things more and more, and yet we're still 178 people down. In what areas? What level of employment yeah, are you looking at? Engineering, technicians, assembly, um, um, uh, you know, just about every aspect of the business. It's not just assembly. It's all aspects of the business. Now, fortunately, um, the state is turning out wonderful engineers. I mean, we have these brilliant kids that are coming out, and, uh, and we're going to hire a lot of them, uh, as many as we can. So, um, but success is interesting. It's how you measure it. And, you know, I've got to be able to build that business for the future, but I have to have people. I can't do it by myself. I can't, you know, we need good people. Utah and the schools turn out good um, engineers, technicians, biomedical engineers. But we need to be very, very thoughtful in terms of public policy about how, how are we going to keep up with it or what's going to happen is we're going to say, well, you, you, you can't hire anybody here, so let's go elsewhere. Hmm. So we have, we have to be very, very wise about that. And it's difficult. It's not a simple answer. I have had the pleasure of interviewing some of the biggest titans of industry here in Utah, and there is a common thread that goes through many of them, and that is their humble beginnings. I mean, John Huntsman is one, and uh, Gail Miller is another, Larry and Ga Gail Miller. You came from humble beginnings as well. What role did that play in your success? Yeah, a lot. Um, you know, I think um, um, coming from a family that really, you know, no one had graduated from high school, coming from a Greek family where people would look down their nose if you were Greek. I remember my dad saying to me, son, promise me that you will never change your name. You know, my uncles changed their name to Lampson or Lambros. 
He said, sometime in your life, that will become really important to you. Uh, I got called a lot of names and stuff like that, or people make fun of how they say the name. Uh, uh, so I think all of those things, um, education, um, you know, uh, but I always believe in the American dream. I always believed, and my dad taught me and my mom, you can be anything you want to be and you can do anything you want to do. And, you know, some people think that dream is lost. Um, it wasn't lost for me, and I don't think it's lost for anybody. I think what people think is that there's an easy path. There's not. I mean, there were times when my mother had to make the payroll. I had to borrow money from my mother as a widow to make the payroll, and I had to pay it back to her with interest. <laughs> I, I think there were those um, kinds of things where people um, just didn't think you could do it, and I think the humbleness uh, today. I have a medical clinic for my employees. Uh, I have my own doctors on campus. I have my own farm to teach people in my own greenhouse. I I'm going to have my own dental uh, program with my own physicians and dentists on campus. And it's because I didn't get those things, and I think they're important. I watched and listened to my mother weep and worry about how she was going to care for her children. And I want to make sure that others don't have to do that. So. There is a difference, and hopefully you can help me identify it or at least uh, illustrate it. There is a difference between those people who are told, no, you can't, and they go out and do it. And then there are those folks who hear, no, you can't, and they believe it. What is the difference between those people? Yeah, well, that's the question of the ages, isn't it? And why, why me? I ask that question to myself all the time. Why isn't it that engineer or this doctor or this person or that person? I, I don't know. I, I have to think from a spiritual point of view that somehow, and, and some people don't want to hear this, but you ask the question, I'm going to answer it. Sure. I've always felt that this was my calling, that my heart was known that I would look after the children and that was my job. And so I think that's another thing that allows me to focus on what my mission in this life is. I've always known that. I've always felt that. And I, and, and I also had some of these great teachers. So someone said, well, you can't do that. I remember Bill Monroe at Granite High School coming up to me and saying, you know, Fred, you're different than other people. I, I wasn't any different. You're going to do great things in your life. And, and, um, and, and I remember thinking, well, he says that to everybody. And I said that to him. I said, Mr. Monroe, you say that to everybody. He said, Fred, I don't say that to anybody. I've just said it to you. And I've always thought, you know, why, why did he say that? What did he see that I didn't understand at the time? And I don't know all these things, Bob. I don't know why. I do know this, that when that opportunity is laid before you and you see the pathway, you're compelled to move. And I think it, part of that comes from the military as well. You know, you assess, you fire, you move. Or you're toast. <laughs> and I think <laughs> or, you business, <laughs> or you die. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think it's the same thing in business. You, you know, you assess, you fire, and you move, and it's the same thing in business. Now, maybe a little different words, but kind of the same concept. And uh, I think that uh, I learned those things from my dad, the military, and just everybody. And, you know, along the way, a little bit of snickering. <laughs> What's he think he's going to do? Or mm. he can't do that? Or what one little syringe? Or what this or that? I mean, I, there was qualifies a, you? I heard it yeah. so many times, yeah. so many times, that it just made me work harder and think, well, I guess I'll, I'll, show, sh you. I'll show you. I'll show you exactly. And, uh, you know, and, and then I get asked the question, did you ever think it would be this big? And the answer is, I did. Uh, when we built our corporate headquarters in South Jordan, out in the middle of a bunch of grain fields 25 years ago, we bought 70 acres. 70. I should so, mention, a that's a lot of land. <laughs> and we didn't buy it so that we could run a farm. We ran it so we could build a business and have space. And, uh, and so, yeah, we, we How hope. close are you to filling it up? Well, we're getting close, but we've just bought another 20 acres or so on top of that. And, um, and so we have plenty of capacity. But, you know, we have facilities in Ireland, in Singapore, in Brazil, in Australia, in, in Ireland, in France, in the Netherlands and four or five plants in the United States, in Texas, in Pennsylvania, and in Virginia. Wow. Wow. So, um, we've got, and there's a lot of human beings out there. And I, and I have to say, because we haven't talked about this, the other thing that is so gratifying is to see a human being, no matter what their station is, rich, poor, 
you know, all, all of the various issues, and we can save their lives. What I do and what we do as a business, we save 15 to 20,000 lives with gifted physicians and our products every single day. Now, what, kind, what, else, what other motivation do you need than to know that you're helping to save and improve somebody's life every day? As we're sitting here, there's hundreds and hundreds of patients all over the planet from Iceland to South Africa to Vietnam to China, Mongolia, India, Europe, uh, you name it, we're there. And that is what's so gratifying. You have a 100-year business plan. You're 30 years into it. Where is Merit Medical going from here? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things we're doing as a business is we've been moving from a, um, I'll call it accessory, syringes, inflation devices, wires, and that sort of thing, to a primary uh, therapy company um, in a company that um, is really now based on disease states and therapies. So that's a transition that we've been in for five years and we'll be in that transition. So rather than just gaining access, now we're developing devices that actually are implanted or that have and make a difference to the outcome of that patient's life. So uh, that takes a lot of money and it takes a lot of time. So you can do a syringe and probably start to finish in nine months and get all the regulatory approvals. We're working on projects now that are seven to ten years. And so the advantage of having all this other business, it helps to support the research that goes into these more advanced products. So without that, we couldn't do those things. Mm. You know, we'd have to have venture capital, private equity, or this or that. But we're kind of our, the master of our own ship here. And that's, I think, an important part of our business. Let's shift to politics here for just a moment. And certainly you had to realize that we, I was going to bring that up a little bit. Um, there are many folks in this country who are very worried and believe that there is a crisis in leadership in this country, not only in the White House, but also in Congress as well. What is your take on the value of character and integrity in leadership? Yeah. Well, it's a really, really good question and maybe the question of our time. Um, but here's what I do know. If you can look back at all of our presidents and almost you and me, we are flawed. And we can sit and make a judgment on everybody. The fact of the matter is we have just as much, you know, many problems and secrets and things as anybody else does. Um, I think it's important. I think people look up to you. And if you can't make that standard, um, that's one thing. Now, on the other hand, and you asked this question, from a business point of view and a policy point of view, this administration has more, done more to help medical device companies and business than any administration, including Ronald Reagan's. Mm -hmm. so, so somebody said, wait a second, yeah, it's because you're a Republican or you're a right wing, whatever you are. No, I mean, the corporate income tax has come down. The medical device tax has been put away for a period of time. Rules and regulations that were burdensome have gone. Um, so there are many, many things that have helped industry, which is why. We have, uh, you know, the president says, now, you know, you've got this terrific growth. You've got all of these opportunities. Now, all of that being said, I think that's all true. Now, all that being said, some of the things he says drives me crazy. Some of his ideas and those things um, I don't agree with. But I, as I've said politically and otherwise, I vote my pocketbook. I vote what's right for my employees, my shareholders, and our business. And very candidly, I haven't seen anything better. So um, I'm kind of stuck like, you know, yeah, I like these policies. I like that this helps me. I can invest more in research and development and jobs and all that sort of stuff. But boy, I sure don't like some of this stuff over here. And then you have to kind of weigh the difference and decide where you're going to go. So um, that's the answer to your question. I don't know if you expected that answer. Uh, absolutely. But, but I was hoping for something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's exactly where we are. There are those who feel like the republic is in danger right now because of this crisis in leadership. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I would say we're just much uh, in a crisis when we have agencies of the government um, that are undermining not just um, a president, but maybe undermining other institutions. Uh, you know, we're all told we can do this and we have to behave ourselves. And yet, as we all know from reading the news, and I don't think these are controversial, 
um, you know, we can see that sometimes the very agencies that take out and talk about all of this wonderful things and all these issues that you're talking about, fidelity and integrity, aren't necessarily living that way. So they're preaching to us, but they're not acting that way. So, I, I, you know, in, in some ways, um, I'm, concern, I'm always concerned about the country. Uh, but at the same time, um, and I think past presidents, very candidly, have been somewhat divisive. I had great hope for this country 10 years ago. I thought this would be a new time. This would be something in where we can really all come together. That's not what I saw. I saw it become more divisive. Now, the president's being, you know, um, accused. And, and again, everybody can make their own call of being even more de de, you know, divisive. I saw that in the last administration. I remember going to the, to the inauguration. My wife and I stood there. We were invited. We were thrilled to be part of history. But when we heard ex-presidents coming out and the crowd booing mm. ex-presidents, mm. I turned to my wife and I said, you know what? I don't think this is quite what we think it is. And in my opinion, that's how it turned out. It, there was so much opportunity that I think was squandered. So let's hope that whatever the issues are with this president, the American people, and I think that's at the end of the day, what I think uh, you know, is one thing, but I think collectively as a nation, um, I have a strong belief in, in the Constitution and the purpose of this nation and what it served and its, its mission on this earth. The people will make the right decisions. They may make a little mistake here, a little mistake there, but they'll get there. So I still have great belief and, and faith in the American people. They'll right whatever wrongs are out there uh, and we'll be fine. Finally, you... You entered the military as a private. You came out in special forces. You led men in combat. You built a company from scratch that now is an international concern. 5,500 employees, more than 200 patents out there from devices that you invented. You ran for public office twice, and you have all these accolades uh, as a businessman. How, do all, how does all of that compare to the fact that your band opened for the Doors and the Beach Boys all those years ago. Yeah. Well, if I could have had the success in music that I have in business, I'd go back to that without any question. <laughs> um, you know, there was a lot of fun growing up as a kid, but if you come into my home or into my office, this music is still playing and, and um, it's something that I enjoy. Um, I'll take what I'm doing today. I'll take my family, my wonderful wife, who, you know, and I ought to mention that. I, I have to say this. Please do. She's sitting right yeah, over there. Yeah, I, I know. You better. And, and, and she'll always say, no, this has nothing to do with this. But the fact of the matter is, you know, this business would not be the same without her. But her guidance, her encouragement, and very candidly, her scolding, and her vision. She's, you know, you said this, now it's this. What do you think about that? It's really nice to have... Um, you know, a, a, a wonderful woman like that who I can talk to, who can guide and give me ideas. And we don't, we don't Keeps often- Keeps your feet on yeah, the floor. She really does. And, yeah. uh, and, and there's the success of this business. You can talk about the devices, this and that. But it, you really go back and look at the last 15 years and see where the business has come versus the previous 15 years. I'm gonna give a lot of that credit to my wife because she sure has helped me a lot and I'm grateful for it. Well, Fred Lampropoulos, founder and CEO of Merit Medical, thank you Bob, so much for being part of Three Questions. Delighted to be here. Thank you so much.